been asked to do is to sort of lay the groundwork for this program. You're going to get into a lot more detail with some of the other topics that come along. But what we wanted to do is to start you off with the basics. And as you heard, I, I understand, I looked at some of the data, I know that some of you folks have a little bit more experience than others, but we want to get everybody sort of on a level playing field and talk about some of the key issues that are involved with science communication. And so what I've got here really is a modified presentation that we do for our presenters at the Science Center when they are getting started. So all of our education staff, the people you see in the theaters, on the floor, people who go out and do outreach, um, as they get started, they go through a, a series of presentations and programs that we do. This is uh, a modification of the very first that they do. And modification, I say, because I want to really stress for you that I believe, as you heard, public outreach is really part of the scientific enterprise now. It must be. It must be integral to what you do as scientists and engineers. It used to be something that some people could do and some people wanted to do. And I'll argue as we go along that now this is something you must do. Okay? You must do for a variety of reasons, some that are good for the public in general and some that are good for you personally. Okay? So you might say, well, <clears throat> what does this guy know about any of this? So I work for the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. Hopefully you know your neighbor here in Oakland, but you know the Science Center over on the north side as well. Uh, four museums, two science and two art museums. Uh, I've been with the Carnegie for 14 years now, uh, but I've been uh, in science education in one way or another for uh, almost uh, a <coughs> year number of years. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm getting up there. I've been doing this for almost 30 years, believe it or not. And uh, I started, actually, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I got the bug for uh, education. I did my undergraduate work in physics and astronomy, uh, but I got the, the bug about education, and that's the direction I went in. Uh, I've taught uh, in, at the K-12 level, level. I taught at the high school level. Uh, I'm an adjunct over at Pitt. I'm an adjunct at Cal U as well, uh, and I've actually done some adjunct work here at CMU as well. Um, and so I've dealt with communicating science in a, a wide variety of forums, and I've sort of seen the same issues come up over and over again. And that's really sort of the basis of what I'm going to talk about, what my experience has been, what the research shows us, uh, and when I think about all that, and what I think you maybe want to be thinking about or asking about as we go forward. So, first question might be, why should we care? And I understand by the very fact that you're here, you're demonstrating that you care. But let's just sort of think about some of the key issues, right? For example, the weakness in K-12 science education, all right? A lot of conversation about this. I will tell you that in the U.S., there is a problem in K-12 education. I am not a big advocate of standardized tests, I will tell you that. But I will tell you that the standardized tests do show that there is a problem that's happening across through K-12 education here in comparison to what's happening in other countries. What I often say to people is there's all kinds of problems with standardized tests, but everybody who's taking the international test has the same set of problems. So if you consistently cannot perform on those tests, there's a little bit of a red flag there, right? Something to worry about. Low public scientific literacy. This is kind of a, a real struggle in a society that is so dependent on science and technology as we are now, more than any time in human history. And yet we see a very low level of understanding about science. When I say scientific literacy, I don't mean just understanding the facts of science and technology, engineering and mathematics. I mean understanding the process and the role they play in our society. Uh, some of the, the data that we've seen shows that most members of the public do not know anyone who is a practicing scientist or engineer or mathematician. If you ask them, you know, friend, family, they will tell you they don't know anyone. So they don't even have a reference frame, someone to talk to about it. And that's a, a key part of the problem. Next piece is the politics of science. If you've been watching the American election, right, you know, this is, this is scary stuff, right? Because we no longer can agree even on the facts of the nature of the universe, right? Used to be we could debate about the interpretation, we could debate about policy, we could debate what do you do about what the facts are. Now we can't even agree on the facts. And uh, as Jesse mentioned, I actually gave a talk about this where I said, you know, that's a deliberate situation. That's not accidental. That's because people have actually made an attempt to discredit science and technology and engineering in our society. How do you do that when those things are so important to us now and to our future? That's a tough one. 
lack of public support. Okay? The way we do science and technology is changing. Getting the resources to do your research is getting tougher and tougher. It used to be, from the, from the period at the end of World War II, uh, up until about 10 years ago, uh, maybe a little sooner than that, you could feel pretty good about the amount of government support that was going to be there for you, right? Well, what has happened over the last 10 years? We've seen that number dropping. Why? Because the public does not see that as a priority. They don't make the connection between the results of the research and making that investment up front. So I think that's a big issue. And there are therefore broad social and financial implications. How long can you go forward as a society in this kind of model? I don't know that we want to find out how long we can go. Because you may not be seeing a whole lot of problems right now, but you sure will see a lot if we continue down the path. That's what I would submit to you. So let me just give you a few uh, numbers and facts to sort of back up what I'm talking about. And uh, we do have all of the references for this. They will post all of this for you so that you can get them. I apologize for not putting in all the footnotes. But student achievement, for example, 3 in 10 Americans say they're bad at math. Among 18 to 24-year-olds, it's almost 4 in 10. And they think that's okay. Could you imagine somebody saying, oh, uh, you know, I'm not a very good reader. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to skip over that. But people say, I don't really understand math, or I don't really understand science all the time. And people say, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. That's okay. Is that okay? Wow. In 2009, just 34% of U.S. 8th graders were rated proficient or higher in a national math assessment, and more than one in four scored below the basic level. And again, not a big advocate of standardized tests, and we could have a whole lecture on why that is that I have a problem with them. But when you see across the board the kind of performance that we're seeing, that says there's a problem. In international exams, 2006, U.S. high school students ranked 21st out of 30 among industrialized nations in science and 25th in math. And only 43% of U.S. high school graduates in 2010 were ready for college work in math, and 29% were ready in science. A little scary. Part of the problem that might be connected to this, teacher qualifications. All right? World Economic Forum ranks the United States 48th in the quality of mathematics and science education in the world. 69% of United States public school students in 5th through 8th grade are taught math by a teacher without a degree or certificate in mathematics. I hope that makes you go, because ah, that's a little scary. 93% of United States public school students in 5th through 8th grade are taught physical sciences by a teacher without a degree or a certificate in the physical sciences. Okay? So we don't have the training at that level to give it to the students. Okay? What about sort of that, that broad scientific literacy that I was talking about? Well, for Americans, this is kind of interesting. What we've got here are statistics showing what the public thinks of these three topics and what scientists think of these three topics. If you ask the American public, do you believe that humans evolved through natural processes, 32% will agree with that only 32%, as opposed to 97% of practicing scientists. If you ask about global warming, right? global warming, climate change caused by humans, does it exist and are humans involved? 46% of the public will tell you that they think that's the case against 97% of scientists. And mandatory vaccinations, do you think vaccination is a good idea? 71% of the public will tell you that. And by the way, this number has dropped tremendously just in the last few years. 84% uh, of practicing scientists will tell you that. When, of course, you look specifically in the categories where the scientists are involved in these areas, the numbers go higher, right? 84% of all scientists' surveys submit. That worries me a little bit, too, though, right? But still, 84%, okay? So... That's the, the disconnect with the public that I'm talking about, okay? And I, I sort of referred to this a little bit before. This is a quote from Carl Sagan, a great science communicator, who said, we've arranged a global civilization in which most crucial elements are profoundly dependent on science technology, more than ever before in human history, right? But we've got a situation where no one understands science and technology, and that is a prescription for disaster. How long can you go down that road 
before you've got a really big problem. As I said before, I don't really want to find out how far we can go down. So if we were to get you involved in public outreach, if we were to get you involved in science communication, what are the benefits we might see from this? Well, an increase in public understanding of the nature of science and scientists. Okay? One of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later on is the fact that personal relationships with people are very important in communicating anything. You know how I talked about the fact that people say they don't know scientists and engineers, right? Well, if you talk to someone who knows you as a person and trusts you as a person, has a relationship with you, your credibility shoots up. And you have a much greater chance then to communicate information about what does it mean to be a scientist, what does it mean to do science, and why is that important. So when I say increasing public understanding, I'm not just talking about going out and going to be talking, I'm talking about an interrelationship with people where you can make an impact. And that will advance the broad scientific literacy. Okay? It can support and improve science education. I really do believe that there are many, many ways to get involved, and some of those ways can go directly towards improving what happens at the K through 12 level. Create visibility in the community for science so that people do know, hey, science is happening in my community. I know people are doing it. I know research is important. I know engineers and the work they do. This is important stuff, and I can tell you a little bit about it happening. I'm more open to it if I see it in the community, okay? And then, perhaps a little selfish, but still important in the big picture, right? This is what's going to let you continue to secure research support. Because sometimes the public outreach you're going to be doing is going to be to people who control the purse strings, right? Because this is not just about Joe on the street. This is about Congressman Joe, whose statistics are even worse than the general public, okay? And you want to get them to understand why this is important, understand what you're really doing, why you have a passion for this, right? and why maybe they should too, okay? why should they should see this important. So again, broad social and financial implications. So what can you do about this? Well, we're going to talk a lot more about this later, but I just want to sort of set the stage. right? What are the kinds of things we're hoping you go through all these you know, seminars, get a little training. What are the kinds of things you could do that would make a difference? Well, I do think it can make a direct impact on formal education. All right? You can do that by being involved in teacher professional development. And you can do that by being involved with students. Just being able to go to a classroom or go to a teacher's meeting and talk to them about what does it really mean to be a scientist? What does it really mean to be an engineer? What has your life experience been like? A lot of them don't have access to that information. Just sharing your time in that way can be huge. There's also the multimedia approach. Right? Maybe you don't want to get up in front of a classroom of kids or, or a group of teachers. Maybe you're better off at writing. All right? Or maybe speaking. Maybe you'd like to do something in print. All right? Maybe you'd be willing to do something on the internet podcasts, TV, radio, maybe you'd be willing to do interviews, have that kind of response, right? Be able to talk about hot topics when they come up or things that pertain to your particular field when you can step up and say, hey, I'm willing to be the expert on this. I'm willing to talk about this. I know something about this. Now, I know that that goes against the grain for our training, right? That's not the way we train scientists and engineers, right? We are always so careful about the way we speak, right? And we want to speak about our particular focus. But you got to remember, in the topics that are being talked about, the level of discussion is at a basic level that you can easily handle. I'll talk more about this, but you can do this. I will, I will give you an example. I do not have a PhD in astronomy, but I have a lot of astronomy experience. I'm an adjunct over at Pitt. Okay? I teach physics and astronomy courses over there. What happens when Pitt gets a phone call about something that's happening in the sky? They call the physics astronomy department, and they say, here's John's number over at the Science Center. Right? Because why? Because the galaxy guy doesn't want to talk about comets, because he might say something wrong. And the comet guy doesn't want to talk about galaxies, because he might get that wrong. 
And the cosmologist doesn't want to talk about planetary science because she might say something wrong. You know what? I'll tell you right now, the questions that they're going to ask in that interview, they could do that. They could do that. And that's the message I'm going to have for you. Don't be afraid of it. You can do it. You are the experts. You can also do traditional lectures and presentations. Many opportunities to get up in front of a crowd and talk. There really are. All right? When we provide many of those at the Science Center. Again, something we'll talk about later. That's something we're hoping that we can engage you in, things like Cafe Scientifique and some of the other programs we do where we can give you a forum to come talk about your work. Okay? And so Museum Science Center partnerships, I think, is something I personally have an interest in that I'd love to talk more with you about later on as well. Okay. So I've, I've kind of been making the case for why we should do this, kind of highlighting some of the issues. And so, right, it's just that simple. Just get out there and do it. End of story. Well, okay, maybe not so much. I understand there certainly are rules of the game, all right? There are things, as I've said, that we see that come up over and over again, things that you might want to be thinking about if you're going to take on this kind of role. And in fact, we talk about the science center, the top 10 things that every science communicator needs to know. And we steal shamelessly. I will tell you that this is uh, based in large part uh, on something done by Gregory and Miller in 1996 um, from a strictly educational point of view. We have modified it in many ways, but I do want to give credit where credit is due. So that's another reference you can look up if you're interested uh, and see how we have distorted everything they said. No, we've really, how we have built on what they've said. So I want to talk to you about these 10 things, okay? What is it that you should be thinking about that maybe is obvious and maybe isn't so obvious, okay? First thing, don't go in cold, right? Take a little time to think about what is this all about, okay? To be conscious and respectful of the roles and the nature of research in higher ed versus formal and informal education, okay? That's not to say that these have to be barriers to you doing any of this thing, okay? But that we're going to give you the opportunity to find out a little bit about these kinds of things. You guys know the research side, all right? But you're going to hear from folks who are going to talk about formal and informal education pieces that fit into this puzzle, all right? So by going through this program that they're setting up, you're going to be addressing number one here. You're going to be finding out what this is all about and how to approach it, okay? And that's going to let you choose your communication vehicles wisely. Not everybody has to do everything, right? Some people say, I could never get up in front of a group and talk about this, so I'm just not going to do it. But maybe you're a great writer, okay? That's a role that you could play. That's a vital role you could play. So you can choose. You can match. Don't be scared away because you don't have to do everything on the list. You don't have to do all of these things, but you can probably find a few that you feel comfortable with and that you can do really well. And that's what we want to help you find, okay? And as you get into this, you want to think about the pluses and minuses surrounding your science and the public. You could be thinking about this proactively. All right? And Arden was just giving great examples. All right? If you're doing animal research, well, maybe you want to find out a little bit about what's going on in terms of the public and their view of that. All right? Maybe if you are involved in nuclear energy, you probably have a sense that there's a public feel about that out there. Make sure you understand how what you're doing connects to this. I'm often surprised when researchers are surprised to find out that the public thinks poorly of what they do, <laughs> okay? Well, maybe you could find out about that, all right? Don't go in cold, all right? You do yourself a disservice as well as the people you're, that you're talking to and trying to help if you don't understand the big picture, okay? Know what you want to accomplish, all right? We want you to have a sense of the kinds of things that you think are important Specific situations will arise as you go along. But if you have a goal in the back of your mind of what you think is important to communicate about science and technology in general, your particular field, okay, then you'll be ready for the opportunities, right? Isn't that sort of one of the definitions of success? You don't know what the opportunities might be when they're coming along, but you try to be as prepared as possible 
so that when an opportunity does present itself, you can speak to this in whatever form. You don't have to literally speak to it or write to it or whatever, but you can communicate about those topics easily and comfortably because you've given some thought about the important things that you want to get across, okay? So what are you specifically hoping to achieve? Who is your intended audience? Maybe you are more comfortable with some audiences than others. Maybe you feel you can make a bigger impact with some audiences rather than others. And this one, what are the take-home messages? How many of you are familiar with the term take-home messages? Great. See, we don't always get that reaction, okay? The idea that in any complicated issue that you're talking about, there may only be two or three points that you're going to get across, sometimes only one that you really want to make clear. And one of the biggest mistakes that we make as science communicators is to say, we got to get everything. Oh, I got to get into all the detail. Well, if I'm going to explain this to you, uh, you got an hour or two, so give me the background mathematics before we get there. Mm, you lost them already, okay? You focus in on the take home message on a particular topic, okay? You know what you want people to be thinking about. There is nothing disingenuous about this, by the way, right? Some people say, oh, well, then you've got an agenda. Yeah, you've got an agenda, right? You want to communicate the correct information. What are the most important things for people to know about your area? You can't tell them everything. You've spent most of your life getting to the point that you're at, right? And now I'm going to give you 30 seconds and stick a microphone in your face. What do you want to say in those 30 seconds? What do you want to get across? And we'll, we'll have in some of the other talks, we'll talk about talking in sound bites. And I know right away, hey, the hair on the back of your neck is going up, uh, talking sound bites. Yes, you can, and yes, you must. And it's really about this. If you know what's important and you know what you want to get across, right? that's about accuracy. That's not about dumbing down. It's not about just pushing a particular agenda. It's knowing what you're going to communicate. Okay. And then, if you're thinking about all of these things, what will success look like? If you do public outreach, when you're done, what are you going to say was success, right? When you're finished, when you say, well, okay, that's not really how I wanted that interview to go. Well, for you to be able to answer that question, how should it have gone, you gotta give it a little thought. What will success look like, okay? Let me just share a, a few of sort of the big goals that we sometimes talk about at the Science Center that touch on some of the things you've said but just to give you sort of an idea, and you've got many more examples there. We only took a handful, but you might be thinking about how they tie to some of these things. Inspiration and appreciation. Don't undervalue that. Getting people excited about what you do, even if they don't get all the details. Getting them inspired and getting them to appreciate it. Just to say, that's cool. That's a big step already, because now they think of you differently. They think of what you do differently. That may drive them to the internet, that may drive them to a book, all right? It may be something that they just remember down the road when that topic comes up again. And they say, oh, here's a chance maybe here, uh, you, know, you know, somebody told me, Melissa told me about this and it was cool, so I, I wanna find out more about it, okay? That's an important goal. And that's what I mean about going into this. Your goal may be just to have people appreciate your field. Maybe that's your starting point. That is a very valuable goal, all right? What else? Accessibility and relevance, understandable and meaningful. This kind of goes to what you guys were saying over there. To understand, to build meaning about this stuff, to really kind of pull the curtain back for people and get them to see some of those big ideas that say, wow, math is connected in a way I never thought of. That level of understanding, that's a harder one to get at, okay? But also, that may be what you're interested in, that you want to help people build meaning around the big ideas in your field. Maybe you're somebody who wants to support formal education, okay? Maybe you're saying to yourself, where well, I think I can have the biggest multiplier, because maybe that's important to you, right? Is that if I can get to teachers and students, because then I can reach a broader number of people, maybe I can make change happen on a bigger level. Great. But also, 
You could go informal, entertainment and lifelong learning, free choice learning, and recreation, okay? Because there are such things as amateurs in a lot of these fields, okay? People who are just interested, okay? These are people who will be advocates, right? These are people who will spread the word, okay? So don't shy away from those casual opportunities, right? Get a chance maybe to speak at a library event, you know? That could be a place where you might get to somebody who's just there to have fun. Oh, that sounded like an interesting, maybe I'll get something out of that, okay? And you're not thinking, well, that person may not ever get up in front of students or do anything else, but if you've planted a seed again, that may make a difference down the road, okay? And then another one we talk about a lot, and this is no, by no means an exhaustive list, of course. You've, you've given us many others here. But the idea of new science, hot topics, okay? What do I mean by that? You cannot pick up the newspaper, right, with something about a headline screaming at you, usually incorrectly, about something that's happening, right, in the world of science and technology. This may be your goal, to be that translator or interpreter for these hot topics, to be able to respond when something comes up and somebody says, hey, there was something you know, I saw in the newspaper about quantum computing, what's that? And you say, oh, here's an opportunity, right? for me to jump in and talk a little bit about that and get people excited about the new things that are happening and showing them the relevance, okay? So this is just to give you a sense of some of the things that we think are some of the biggest, most important areas, but of course, some of these fit in here, some are, are their own. You will come up with many more. We want you thinking about those goals, and it's okay if people don't agree on goals. You can have a different set of goals, okay? But think about where you're coming from. Very quickly, let me ask about audiences. Did you get a chance to talk about audiences at all? So maybe some people could, uh, you may almost ask for different people this time, give us an example of the audiences you think you'd like to reach. First, I have to check out why that's not unusual. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. So why is that person important? Uh, because they're a random sample of the public. Okay, great. Who else? Yes, please. Students. I'm sorry. School students. Students. So K through 12 students? Yeah. Students in school. Okay. Great subset. Who else? My neighbors. Uh huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that is a great example. And, and let me just have a little aside on this one. Um, we mentioned global warming before, and I used that as an example in, uh, in my talk on the war on science. Um, this is one of the strategies that's now happening, is identifying scientists and the research they do, and literally going after them personally and doing things like showing up on their front lawn, doing things like trying to discredit them, doing things like calling their kids' school to make threats. I mean, this is a brave new world, right? This is scary stuff. So yes, getting your neighbor, that, that personal connection that makes a difference, right? Because that's what you're, and I'm not trying to scare you, but that kind of stuff really happens. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes? Well, my family, uh, I don't mean just my parents, because well, they would be proud of me if they embrace me. <laughs> 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 like, uh, for example, I have some of my cousins who are like, younger than me, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to convince them that science is cool and that they should be scientists. So mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah, sometimes that's, I don't know, sometimes that's easier, and sometimes that's a lot harder. <laughs> right? Yes? Uh, as an educational technologist, you have to worry not just about the students, but teachers, administrators, and actually parents are, are really important segment to convince of the value of technology and science uh, and psychology in, in understanding how their kids are learning in the classroom. Yeah, that, that actually is a huge one and, and one that uh, finally a lot more attention is being given to because um, where, where do the, the students have their interaction most often? They have it with their parents. And if their parents are dismissive 
of STEM, if, if the parents are able to, to say to them, oh, you know, I know you're not good at math, I wasn't good at math either, right? Those kinds of things have a huge impact. So you've touched on a lot of these students, families, especially parents, um, adults, organized groups, early learners, right? Don't think you can't, right? Maybe that's not high on your list, but when you talk about students, I said K to 12 or even pre-K to 12, we actually do STEM programs for students as young as three and four, just going after the idea of natural curiosity, that that's cool, okay? That you can use numbers to figure things out. You can do things like that. Don't think you can't talk to young kids. That may not be high on your list, but I'm just saying, don't think you can't. Yes? Yes. Yes. And and yes. So that will be a topic. I will defer to some, but I will say this: that one of the problems there is that the media does not exist anymore in the way that it used to. One of the first things that has been cut in this new market approach to news has been the traditional science department, the science and technology department. And so you find in many newspapers, those that still survive online, they don't have dedicated people anymore. So, so that's, a, that's a tough one. And trying to get to those people who might be writing the entertainment column you know, tomorrow, and today they've been given the science assignment. So great, great topic, and you will get a lot more about that. They, these guys have that high on their list. Okay, I'm going to keep things moving, uh, pick up a little speed here. Uh, number three, be accurate but accessible, right? Good science communicators, we already touched on this a little bit, are good science translators. It's about making that which is complicated simple, all right? You can do it. Okay, it is not about dumbing down. And that's one of the things I hear so often from scientists, right? But you know what, in this context, less is sometimes more, okay? You have to meet people where they are. And you don't have to give them every single detail to get them to understand some key points. But that puts work on you, right? To go back and think, what are the most important points? And what can I say Keeping it simple, what can I leave out and do it in such a way so that it's still accurate, right? That's why when they stick the microphone in your face, you've already thought about what you're going to say. You're, oh, you've already chosen your words, right? And you're not going to get hung up on it. I'll tell you one. This is, this is a funny one. We're working on a NASA grant. Uh, we're doing a, a program on heliophysics, uh, all about the sun's interaction with the Earth. We're dealing with the uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory research team, and they're helping us work on a script. We're working on one of the pieces of Planetarium Show, and we got into a discussion about the script where they were very concerned that we said in the script that a magnetic field line was broken. And they wanted to be very clear that they disconnect and reconnect, but don't say they break. And I said to them, from the point of view of the fourth graders who will be seeing that, can you help me understand the difference between disconnecting and reconnecting and breaking? There's a lot of silence on the other end. <laughs> Let me get back to you on that. Because they were very concerned. They didn't like that word. But it's not about the word. If it turns out that that concept is bad, great. Correct us. That's why we're talking to you. But what's the concept really? Don't get hung up on the words. How can you make this simple to understand? And if you can say that something breaks, as opposed to disconnects and reconnects, and you haven't lost anything, I would suggest to you you can go there. All right? You've got to just think this through. Okay? And yes, it is harder than you think. I'm not trying to say it's easy. Okay? But I do believe you can do it. Okay? And Arden mentioned this before. It's one of my favorite quotes. And I understand it's a little sexist, but it's dated, that's right. So your grandparents, all right, you do not really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. And everybody knows who said this, right? Who said this? Einstein, right? And 
there's more to it than just about making it simple, okay? It really does speak to your understanding. And I would say this to you as a challenge, right? It is hard work to make something simple that you've put so much time and energy into, right? But I really do believe if you understand it, who better, right, than to be able to explain it in a simple way? And, and I don't know how much teaching experience that you've had. I've had a lot. And I am happy to tell you about the aha moments that I had, especially early in my career, where you're zipping along and saying, so this proves this and this and this. Damn, that's why that works. You know, where suddenly, in attempting to explain to somebody else, you make a connection in your head that you hadn't, I never even thought about that way, and I understand it at a new level. So this is a challenge to you. You will understand what you're doing better if you can find ways to explain it simply, if you can find models and analogies that you can share with people who don't have the rich STEM background that you have, okay? That's what it's about. And you don't have to trade off accuracy. I really truly believe you can sometimes leave things out that's not misleading. And you just have to make sure you think about what you can put in and what you can leave out. Okay? Ah, uh, tough one. Be fun, exciting, and engaging. All of these audiences you want to reach, they are self-selected. Right? What do I mean by that? Even if you get invited to a classroom to speak to a bunch of kids that you don't have them, right? They're out the street and down the corner, right? They've gone to Carolina in their mind. They're not there. You have to pull them in. You have to engage them. They're self-selected. They do not have to give you their time. So you have to make it fun and exciting. And I sometimes hear from science, oh, this is fun and exciting. This is important stuff. Yes, it's important stuff. I get that. That's why we're all here. We know it's important stuff. But you are doing this, right, because at some point in your life, this inspired you. There was a spark. You think this is fun. You have enthusiasm about this. And maybe the pressure of research and grants and grades and everything else has dampened that a little bit. But if you take a step back, right, you know you're putting yourself through this suffering for a reason, right? Don't be afraid to share that. One of the first things that will get people to sit up and listen to you or read you is if they see you are excited about what you're talking about. Because they'll say, wow, he thinks this is cool. Maybe I can listen for a second. And that's all you need, right? You just need to get their attention for a little bit, and you can pull them in. That's not fake. That's real. That's reconnecting with why you think it's important, why you get up every day and do this stuff. Because it ain't for the money. All right? So share that, all right? And the educational research shows that the experience matters. If they are having fun, if they are excited, they are engaged, they will retain. There is some research that shows, we talk about this with our theaters all the time. We, we have many theaters, planetariums, the Omnimax, things like that. Research has shown if you greet people at the door, even for a pre-programmed show where you're going to press the button and it's going to play, but you greet them, you smile at them, how you doing, welcome to the planetarium, these are the best seats, they retain more of the content. You have put them in the comfort zone. They like you, okay? They are more likely to listen to what's going to be presented, and they are more likely to retain it, okay? And again, you say, oh, that sounds like you're manipulating people. No, not at all, because if you really have enthusiasm about what you're doing, you're just sharing it. But once you do that, if they get a sense, hey, this is cool, or this is fun, or I might like this, and I like that person, I am much more likely to listen to you if I like you. And a smile sometimes is all that it takes. So don't forget the little things, all right? Be fun, be exciting, be engaging. This is an important one to keep in mind. The audience is not a blank slate. You have to meet them where they are. They think they know even if they don't. And we are all like this in different areas, different content, all right? So what do I mean by this? Again, some of the research shows that one of the biggest things in science education that people don't often think about is that people have to navigate the world. And so somewhere along the line, they have incorporated explanations for the world, whether they are right or whether they are wrong. And you cannot get them to accept new information 
if you don't find out what those misconceptions are and show them that those misconceptions are not the case. Very simple one from astronomy that we deal with all the time, what causes the seasons? Most people have heard along the way that the Earth's orbit is not a circle, and sometimes we are closer to the sun and sometimes we are farther away. Very simple explanation. Therefore, when we are closer, it is warmer. When we are farther away, it's cooler. You have the seasons. And that's not the reason. Okay? It's all about the tilt of the Earth's axis. Not going to go into that, but to say that if you want somebody to understand what really causes the seasons, you must take on that misconception. Don't assume that there are blanks, that they're sitting there waiting for you to tell them what causes the seasons. They think they know what causes the seasons. And you can say, you know what a lot of people think? Without in any way saying, you know what you think? I used to think this. Lots of people think this. You can present it in a respectful way, but you've got to get at what they really know. They are not blank. Yes? You make assumptions. You have to. Absolutely. And we were just talking about this before. I know that some of you in here are not as fully engaged as others, because there are some of you in here who probably know just as much or more about this topic than I do. All right? But I also know from what everything we've been seeing that you are in the minority. <laughs> okay? And so we are pitching right now, I am pitching, to where I think most people are on this topic. And it's not because I don't care about you who are at a higher level. I know there's some more sophisticated talks coming later for you, okay? Um, and I'm not saying it's you guys. I'm just going <laughs> that general direction. But, but my point is, you have to pitch where you think most people are. And so, for example, there is research that will show you things like what people understand and what people don't. If you work in astronomy education, you find out about this season thing pretty easily. And so if I'm going to write something about the seasons, I'm going to go with the assumption that many of my readers have this misconception. There is a whole area in education that is called misconception theory. Great work that was done, uh, in a, a video done called A Private Universe uh, by a guy named Phil Sadler. I worked for him at Harvard for a while. And he, he did, he interviewed Harvard students and faculty at graduation and asked them about the seasons. And so you see these new PhDs all talking about, well, when we're closer to the sun, you know, because that was built in the misconceptions. So you can find the information for your area on some of the common misconceptions. You can Google this and you can see. You can get it middle school level, high school level, common misconceptions. The stuff is out there. You work from that. And that's not going to get to everybody, but it's going to make a big difference. Make sense? Okay? The audience will expect expertise and competence, not condescension. All right? So you know they've got misconceptions, but you have misconceptions about other things and you're not aware of it. Okay? You have to understand that these are smart people. All right? The audience member, right, the audience you're trying to reach is just as intelligent as you are, but does not possess your store of knowledge. By the way, this doesn't apply to talking to members of Congress. <laughs> he or she is not a student preparing for an examination. No. You've got to assume, right? I, you know, having some fun with that. And we know. We know you're the cream of the crop. That's why we want you to do this, right? But people have expertise in other areas. Carl Sagan used to tell a story about when he was at a faculty reception early in his career, and he was talking to an MD, PhD, right, biological research. Oh, I'm an astronomer. I'm new to the faculty. Oh, uh, what are you interested in? Well, I'm talking about this, that, and the other thing. And the MD, PhD in biology said to him, oh, that's fascinating astronomy. I've often wondered what stars are. <laughs> And in that moment, Sagan realized he wasn't joking. He does not know what stars are. Brilliant person in his field, but he had never looked at this other field. So give people the benefit of the doubt. You can always backtrack afterwards, right? But give them the benefit of the doubt, OK? That was H.G. Wells, by the way, right? Another great communicator who came up with that quote, OK? Big one. And I know I'm picking up speed here. I want to be um, conscious of your time. I want to only go to 7 o'clock. Uh, but there will be plenty of time to talk about these others as we go forward. Establish trust with the audience. Okay? What does that mean? One of the biggest mistakes we make as science communicators is we focus on just the content and not the process. The way you gain trust 
and have a relationship with the people you're communicating. And you can do this online and through writing. This does not have to be a face-to-face -face thing. But you have to talk about how we know what we know. All right? You have to put that piece of the puzzle in. Why do you think this is so? All right? And to say, we know this because this is how science works, and this is what we've learned about this topic or that topic. Not just, this is the way it is. This is what causes the seasons, end of discussion. No, how do we know that? How do we know that the Earth's shape of the Earth's orbit doesn't matter? Okay? That will take them to that next level of understanding. And don't shy away from what we are less certain about. Right? Self-correction of science, one of its key strengths. Now, I want to be clear about this, because I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. One of the things that mistakes scientists make often that drives me crazy right, is that they want to be so exact. So they discount everything. Right? They say, well, my research seems to show, and I think it may be possible, but perhaps if there was more research in this area, we just may. And people say, this is a great commercial about, uh, you know, the guy's talking about the, uh, who hit a certain average or a certain number of hits. It's a beer commercial, I think. And he says, oh, is that really that guy? And he goes, oh, I'm 99.9% .9 certain. And the other guy goes, so you really don't know. Okay? And that's what you do when you put in all of those qualifiers. Don't do that. Okay? You know when something is solid and when it isn't. All right? You know, we could say, yes, nothing is absolutely certain, but here's where the evidence takes us, and we can say this with a degree of certainty. I said to these guys when we were talking once, right, we don't know what an electron is. That's a horrifying thought, isn't it? But it hasn't stopped us from making all of this technology that you're all using right now, right? Because we have a pretty good idea, all right? We have some understanding of what's going on, and we can manipulate it, right? Those particle physicists, they still want to know exactly what it is. They don't know yet, but we can say with a degree of certainty that we do. We don't understand all about fluid dynamics. We're not exactly sure what keeps a plane up in excruciating detail. But we know enough that you get on the plane and you fall asleep while you're going down the runway at 200 miles an hour because you're pretty damn sure that by the time you get to the end of the runway, you're going up. Okay? And people can relate to that. Right? So don't disqualify what you know, but don't hide what you don't know. All right? That's where you give trust. This is where you say, well, we're really certain about this. This, not so much. That's what builds up trust in the communication. Okay? And what that really is, what that says to me, what I say to my staff is, that's exploring science together. That's being a co-learner. That's getting people to feel like we are in this together. All right? And the, the old saying about that, Right? is that you don't want to be someone who's just pontificating about this. Right? You want to be the guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. Right? So we're in this together. All right? That will make a difference in how people will respond to you. Give them more than just the facts. Well, I kind of touched on this a little bit. Right? Listen to what people really want to know. If you just tell them what you want them to know, you're going to miss out on opportunities. Let them ask questions, even if it's not the right question. Because then you can steer it a little bit. Right? It gives you information, lets you know where they are, lets you know what they're thinking about what you're saying to them, right? and lets you steer them. And you can always say, even if the question is completely off base, OK, that's a great question. You know, it's a little bit different than what I'm talking about, as opposed to, what the hell are you talking about? Right? And you will run into this, right? You, you will run into this, the, the, the disconnect, something that's not even wrong. Right? You know, you ask them what time it is and they say blue. Okay? And you have to be able to take that information in. Well, clearly, they didn't understand what I was talking about. I've got to listen to that. It's got to be a two-way street. I can't assume everything. Okay? I can start with assumptions, but I have to listen to what comes back. Okay? So what you're really doing is you're negotiating new knowledge and understanding. Okay? That's what I mean by back and forth. You're helping them to get to a place. Okay? And this can still happen, again, for those people who might choose to go by writing, because it's a whole different world these days. You post something on the block, and people are going to write back to you. And people are going to post comments, and you get a chance to reply. So there's still a dialogue that goes on. Okay? 
Be prepared to explain some of the workings of science. Don't shy away from that. Let them know what works and what doesn't work, okay? And it's a, it's a two-way street. Make sense? Okay. This is a biggie, I think. Acknowledge the humanity of science. Science isn't perfect and neither are we, right? Get that right up front. Just like any field, there's good guys and bad guys. There's people who are good at what they do and people who don't, all right? One of the things, though, that science has going for it that makes it such a powerful tool is even though all these things are true, it can create problems as well as solve them. It is neutral, right? None of what we do is inherently good or evil, right? It's how it gets applied, all right? So bad things can happen, okay? What do you want to do with the knowledge that you uncover, okay? But it's a powerful tool because it is self-correcting, okay? And so our understanding of the universe, I mean, I, I, and I say this to people all the time, is that the power of science to me is, can you give me an example of some other way that we can know about the universe that is more reliable than this, okay? Make mistakes, dead ends, right? You can even have bad people. I use the example of Newton a lot. Probably one of the greatest scientific minds of all time. Sociopath, okay? Tried to suppress the work of others. Had an enemies list, people he went after, okay? But in the end, what was of his work that stood, stood the test of time, is acknowledged. That that didn't was overturned, okay? May have taken a while. His efforts may have pushed it back years or even decades at times. But even somebody who's doing the wrong thing can't overcome the flow of science. What's going to happen with science and technology that it will get us to a better and better understanding. People don't know that, okay? Letting them know that this, this is a tool that we developed. This should be like one of our proudest accomplishments that we came up with this idea of how you can approach the universe and how you can apply what you learn. And that's what STEM's all about. It's the seeking of the knowledge and then the application to human purposes. And it does make our lives better if we make the choice to make it better. And that's powerful stuff. And trying to communicate that, I think, is one of the most important things that we can do. Right? People should take pride in science and not see scientists as uh, cold and distant. Right? That's one of the biggest things you're up against. Right? You're all geeks. You're all nerds. Right? and you're locked away in the lab, and you don't socialize with people, and you haven't had a date in six months, and you know, all that stuff. And some of it may be true, but, okay? But you're people like everybody else, right? And you have your ups and downs, you have the things that excite you and things that don't, things that make you angry, you have different political views, different social views, all right? Just like everybody else. Don't let them see you as a part, all right? As away from the community. You are in the community, yes. <laughs> so we're so informal here. Reality check. There's a 10 minute difference. Am I, am I really have five minutes or I have 15? Um, well, we have a little bit of time to have questions and wrap up. So you do have to. Okay, we'll, we'll still go fast. But uh, again, I know I've picked up some speed going a little faster over this. I would have spread it out a little bit more, even though I don't want you to think that I don't think this is important. I think this is one of the most important things in the process. And then engaging, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Black holes that are going to end the world, yeah. I mean, that's we got phone calls, we did. When you start talking about your research and it happens to be related to that, if they like, almost shut down, mm -hmm. they have all these other concerns that they want to tell you about. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, instead of listening. To yeah. If you can be a trusted voice, again. You know, so the person you're talking to, if they know you, and say, oh, I know this guy. This topic upsets me a little bit, but I know him enough that I'm going to feel comfortable to say, hey, you know what, that scares me a little bit. Isn't that dangerous? That's an opening that is so precious. 
that you've got to go for. And you don't want to be like, of course not. Or, you, know, you don't want to be dismissive that way. You want to go, oh, yeah, I've seen some of the people, they've written stuff about this. Believe me, let me tell you, I wouldn't do something like this if I thought that could happen. And it really can't happen, and this is why. And then based on that relationship, you know, they may not completely believe you at that point, but you might get them, just as some people gave examples of before, saying, oh, okay, maybe that makes sense. Maybe I'll look into that. So those are actually opportunities to go after. Now, when you're talking more with the general public, I will tell you, this is, this is a tough one. Uh, Jesse saw the, did you stay for the Q&A with the war on science? Yeah, so we had that, we had that one, right, they had that one guy who, um, he was just looking for a fight. And I tried to engage as much as I could, but I basically had to say to him, you know what, let's talk afterwards, because he was just kind of taking over the Q&A session. Um, and basically, global warming is a hoax, and you know, even though that was just one of the topics I touched on, but that was his thing, and I'm misleading people and stuff like that. And I tried to engage as much as I could, but again, you have to know when to back off too. And that's one of the things we try to, to teach our presenters about too: is you look for when you're being invited into exchanges and when you're getting the back off. And sometimes it is better to back off and let it go because you might get another opportunity later. You'd be surprised. People will come back sometimes and say that they cooled off, they thought about it. Now I have another question for you, because I wasn't really sure. And you get an opportunity again. Whereas if you come on too strong, you might never get that opportunity, because they say, now I know you. I classify you in that group over there, and I don't want to know you anymore. Okay? And that is a fine line, but that, I think that's a big part of it. So engaging the audience. Um, you want interaction participation. I can't stress this enough. You want some back and forth. All right? You want to get the feedback, know when to engage, when to hang back. We call this the visitor experience model. I won't go into great detail here, but I will say this. What research shows is that when people are going to learn something, there's an interaction. There's their environment. There's the person they're getting information from. And there's where they start. And everybody starts at a different place, right? They've got their misconceptions or what they don't know or what they do know. Some people know more than others. Their potential for growth depends on where they start, all right? And it's going to deal with the interaction of the whole situation. So sometimes it's not just you, all right? It's the situation that you're in as well. You have to take that into account. And what we say is the growth occurs when you go from a, an area like this you have some experience, they grow into their potential, and now they have a new area of potential to move in. It's incremental, okay? You have to, again, I've said this before, take people where they are and move them where you can. Getting people, um, Arden gave the example before, getting people to just say, okay, maybe you're not nuts, and maybe there's something about global warming, you've said some things that are interesting to me, that growth was probably all the growth that he could hope for from that person at that time. That's a home run. Now what happens next? Well, you want him to go further, you hope more happens, you hope there's an exchange. I will say several months later, he emailed me again and said, I believe this and I think we should be doing a lot more about it. Um, I don't know if that'll always happen, but he, he made little steps and then, you know, I just let it incubate for a while and he really came a much further away than I ever thought he would. Perfect. Take, take the step that you can and let it incubate. Don't think that you have to, you don't have to go the whole way. You don't have to get them to match you at the end of the conversation. You can't. You've invested a lifetime. Okay? All right. Last but not least, walk the walk and talk the talk. All right? We tell our staff this all the time. I would say this to you. What do I mean? Become a student of science communication. That's what you're doing. So I applaud you for that. All right? Look up some of the stuff that we're talking about. Look at the research. Find out what's out there so that you can become a better communicator. You're chirping at me. Thank you. <laughs> All right? Um, visit museums and science centers because we want your money. No, because that helps too. All right? Read popular science publications outside your field, inside your field. See how other people do it. Okay? Read the classics. All right? See what Carl Sagan said. Go back and look at so you know. Go back and look at things like Cosmos, and you know why was that such a big change in science communication 30 years ago? Okay, um, and see what people are doing now. Okay, there are some people out there who are doing some great stuff. All right, learn from the people who are out there. All right, watch the science education programs when you can find them. Right, <laughs> on the History on the History Channel. Right, maybe it's not there, but there's still some great stuff out there. Nova and all of that. 
I can assure you, lots of work has gone into that. See the way they approach it, okay? Be a student of what's going on, and learn about the links between science and other areas of human activity. If you know the history of your field, that's a connection with people that's really important. Okay? You can talk about what we used to know, where we are now, where we think we're going. It puts it in context. Okay? That's what this is about. Put STEM in context for people right? so they know that it does matter in their daily lives. When you, can, when you can make a connection about something you're talking about that, that goes to an everyday experience or a technology or something that they can relate to, all right, show the connection. Seek those out, all right? And, and that takes a little bit of work. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not, okay? And in your particular field, I grant you, sometimes it may be harder than it is for some other topics, okay? but you can see what other people have done with that. You can talk to each other and to us about it. This doesn't have to be a lone battle. I mean, you may decide, I don't mean to pick on you, but it was so great that you brought this up, but you may decide for your goal and what you want to communicate that one of the biggest things you want to have come out of being part of all this is coming up with an analogy, a model, a set of words that allows you to communicate some of those really complicated things in the simplest form. And if you can do that, that is powerful. That is not a small goal. That is huge. And that's something you can share with other people in your field and get them to do. And that will make you someone who is sought out because you can get people to understand what you're doing. Okay? So that, that's powerful stuff. That's valuable stuff. Okay. Wow. Time goes fast. Okay? So last but not least, good science communication inspires someone to read a book, take a course, most important, to learn the method of scientific thinking. It provides reason for hope, strikes the spark, awakens slumbering curiosities, and ignites the scientist that lives in all of us. I truly do believe that people want to be engaged in science and technology. They do want to know about these things because it is all around them. And sometimes it's about getting past that fear, but they want to know. And if you're doing good science communication, you will pull them into that. And that was a quote from Carl Sagan. All right? Now, I will tell you that I, I promised I would tell these guys, I told these guys I would tell this story, um, but not to scare you. This is not easy. I'm so thrilled to see all of you here. Carl Sagan paid a price for what he did. He made a decision that he thought science communication was so important that he put a tremendous amount of effort into that. If you look uh, up Carl Sagan and his life and his history, um, he did a tremendous amount of research. Planetary science, in particular, was his specialty. He was largely involved in uh, the uh, Viking landers, the Voyager missions. He's got a tremendous background, number of papers he had written, all of that. But he made the decision that he thought communicating that to the public was critical. And that's how he got involved in writing books, and writing fiction, science fiction, and doing things like Cosmos because he thought it would make a difference, and he paid a price for it. This man, who would easily have made it into the National Academies of Science, was not able to be voted in. And at the time, people said they would not vote for him because he wasn't a real scientist. He spent his time talking to the public. Okay? Could not have been further from the truth. He not only did great science, but he advanced the understanding of science. If only we had someone of Stegen's stature now. We've got some people out there trying and doing a good job. But this guy you know, rose to a level of uh, a stature with the public that astronomy became more popular, the space program became more popular again because of what he was talking about. So you can have an influence. I'm not saying you guys all have to have a second career making Nova episodes or anything like that. But it just goes to show how important it is, and don't let other people tell you it's not. Because now, even more than it was 30 years ago, Sagan was ahead of his time. He knew this had to be what all scientists did. And he said that to his colleagues all the time. You need to do this. Okay? And I just think that's an example that we'd really like to follow if we could. Okay? So in the end, what you do with science communication, it's going to reflect your unique characteristics the community that you're trying to serve and embrace, you're going to put your own twist on it. But what we hope we can do is give you the tools to make that happen. 
And with that, I'll finally shut up. Okay? <laughs> I hope that was valuable. Thank you.